Very good. Very good way to start. Well, that's a better introduction than I could ever give to Dr. Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank. We're honored to have him here with us at this second summit. Uh, again, uh, I have the highest esteem for Dr. Kim and, and, and his capacity as head of the World Bank, but I must say that uh, to me his uh, crowning achievement is he's a graduate of Muscatine High School in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, attended the University of Iowa, graduated from Brown University and of course Harvard Medical School, has had a very distinguished career, uh, co-founded the, the Partners in Health uh, that did so much good in Haiti over such a long period of time. He then became an advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization. He returned to Harvard Medical School where he became Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Then he became president of Dartmouth College and now president of the World Bank and will serve in that capacity. I understand was just re-elected to a second term and will be there until 2022. Uh, so again, Dr. Kim, thank you very much for all you've done in your career in the past. Uh, uh, again, uh, thank you for what you're doing as leadership of the World Bank. Uh, you. Since we first, when we first, well, we first met in my office when you first took over, but we first met about this in the spring of 2016, and uh, the World Bank became a partner and a supporter of this uh, last year and also this year. Uh, Charlene uh, 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 McLean Nalapo. I always get hung up on names that have hyphenated, but, uh, but uh, Charlotte has been a great supporter and uh, worked with us on all of our, of our uh, planning committee. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank, thank you, Charlotte. Um, I think for the benefit of everyone who's here, we have uh, uh, businesses and we have philanthropies and we have uh, uh, organizations, uh, individuals from disability groups. Just what's the mission of the World Bank? I, I, you know, I'm from Iowa, and a lot of people out there, you say the World Bank, they think that's, you know, you save your money there or something. <laughs> I don't know. Tell us about the mission of the World Bank. Well, first of all, um, uh, Senator Harkin, you were my senator, and uh, I, I want to thank you for championing um, the, uh, the disabilities uh, uh, agenda and, and for um, helping us to, to, to step up even more. But it's, um, um, you know, at a time when, when um, we're all wondering where we're going um, politically in the world, you have been such a voice for inclusion and decency and justice, and so we're, we're we are um, uh, very, very proud to follow uh, uh, in your footsteps and, and to, to do what we can. Thank you know, uh, the World Bank, uh, back when it was founded in the um, in the mid 1940s, the idea was that it, it would it would uh, rebuild Europe, and then um, literally a year and a half or two years after the founding of the World Bank, uh, George Marshall gave a speech. At, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the graduation ceremony at, of Harvard, actually, announcing the Marshall Plan. And so um, uh, the, the vast majority of the money that went into rebuilding Europe came from the Marshall Plan. And so we had to find other things to do. I mean, the first loan, in fact, was to France uh, for the World Bank Group. Yeah. But then over time, um, we evolved into uh, tackling uh, issues related to economic development all over the world. Um, uh, Robert McNamara, uh, during his uh, uh, tenure uh, that uh, ended in 1981, a period of about 13 years, 78, I mean, 68 to 81, he really focused on this notion of fighting absolute poverty. Uh, but, you know, t realistically, from 45 until really about um, the mid-2000s, uh, you know, the World Bank was an institution that was making the case that global market capitalism was the direction that the world was going to go. And it was uh, in many ways in opposition to this idea that, the, that what's, the system that's going to prevail is 
planned economies, you know, the, the, the socialist communist world that traded with each other. So it was, it was part of an ideological argument, but now that has changed so much that you have President Xi Jinping saying, you know, the global market system is the ocean we all swim in, and, uh, and uh, any effort to turn it back into lakes and streams is going to fail. Mm. So, so it, it, the argument has shifted, and now the, the, the real question is, what can we do, given that everyone lives in the global market system, what can we do to make it work for everybody, literally to help everyone be able to swim? And we really mean everyone. Now, um, uh, when I got here, I walked in and I saw on the wall of the World Bank Group this, uh, uh, the, the, this little sign. It was carved into the concrete. It said, our dream is a world free of poverty. And so I just asked the question, well, so when are we going to turn the dream into a goal with a deadline? And uh, we spent about nine months. And then uh, in about nine months after I arrived, uh, we established two goals, which is to end extreme poverty. Uh, and extreme poverty today is defined as living on $1.90 a day or less. And then also um, we added something new, which the World Bank has never really um, addressed before, which is inequality by saying we're going to boost shared prosperity, meaning we're going to do everything we can so that the bottom 40% in every country, every developing country, that their incomes grow faster than um, the, uh, the rest of the economy. So uh, uh, tackle inequality by, by focusing on the bottom 40% and end extreme poverty. And then it, we evolved and, and we are now focusing on three uh, very, very important ways of getting there. The first is the traditional, and we call it inclusive, sustainable economic growth. And uh, very important that it's both inclusive and, and, uh, and sustainable. Uh, the second part is to build resilience, meaning uh, uh, there's so many different um, forces in the world that are literally battering um, developing countries. Climate change is a big one. Pandemics like Ebola in Africa, uh, but also um, the, the problem of refugees. And so we, uh, the second major pillar is to build resilience to those kinds of shocks, refugees, climate change, pandemics. But finally, and the one that we just launched um, uh, during the, uh, the, the, the annual meetings that just uh, were finished, is a focus on investing in people. Right? Now, um, in, nine, in 19, not between 1990 and 1994, um, I was part of a movement uh, called 50 Years is Enough. You, re you, remember, you probably remember it. We, we argued that uh, on its 50th anniversary, which was 1994, the World Bank and the IMF should be closed. So we, we, we advocated for the closing of these two institutions. We went on the streets, we wrote books. I wrote a whole book about how the World Bank should be closed. Excuse and, me, Dr. Kim, you mean you led the effort to I didn't, I didn't lead the effort, but, but I was in, part of the effort. And, and I, now you're and the I, president and of the and I, Yes, and so, <laughs> so the important thing there is we lost that argument about closing the World Bank. And, and, and what happened was in 1995, um, uh, the, uh, the new World Bank president at that time, Jim Wolfenson, whom I, I know you know well, uh, Jim really uh, tried to take the bank away uh, from this um, uh, image of being this sort of monolithic uh, 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 dictatorial institution that told all the developing countries what to do and sometimes caused uh, poverty to get worse. Uh, back in 1995, the reason we, I objected so much to the World Bank's activities is they weren't really focused on investing in human beings. And in many countries, health budgets and education budgets were shrinking based on World Bank, um, uh, uh, World Bank uh, advice. And so uh, just this past month, uh, and literally starting in October, uh, we began um, a project we call the Human Capital Project. Now, it's not, we use the term human capital, but we're really talking about human beings. But the reason I use the term human capital is that now that we have so much better data on health outcomes and educational outcomes, what we found is that improving educational outcomes, meaning not, not you know, putting kids in school, but making sure that all children are learning and improving health outcomes, uh, meaning uh, not just putting money into a budget or building fancy hospitals, but actually improving the outcomes. We found that, that improving those outcomes is probably a stronger driver of economic growth than anything else that mm -hmm. we have measured over time. Mm -hmm. So that, that we've just started this so-called human capital project, but the, 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 the core of all of it is that um, the World Bank is supposed to do everything it can uh, to give everyone equality of opportunity. You know, uh, what, when, when uh, China 
shifted its um, uh, approach to economic growth in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, they essentially embraced uh, the market, the global market. And in the period from 1990 to now, they lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Wow. And the, the, the essential insight has been that, well, during the years before, when they tried to dictate equality of outcomes, and this is true, I think, for um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the former Soviet Union, all those countries that tried to dictate equality of outcomes, what we found is that didn't work very well. So if, if we've given up on this notion of equality of outcomes, everyone's the same, everyone has the same income, everyone has the same outcome, then what we have to do is commit to equality of opportunity. And again, this means everybody, including people with disabilities. So that, that's our focus. Our focus is how can we use all the tools of the World Bank Group, including very, very uh, um, uh, esoteric at times financial tools, uh, to ensure that everyone on Earth has the opportunity to swim in that uh, ocean, as President Xi uh, described it. Uh, and, and now, with this latest data that shows that investing in human beings is uh, is going is going to be the f you know it, looking back 25 years, it, you know it's it's probably the most important factor in determining which countries have grown uh, uh, more rapidly uh, versus those who have that countries that have not grown very rapidly, and then as you look forward. It's, it's only going to get um, uh, become more important because as, as, as uh, artificial intelligence and robotics uh, automation uh, really gets rid of the low-skilled jobs, um, the low-skilled manual labor type jobs, those are, many of them are going are to be taken over by machines, uh, then investing in your people so that every single uh, citizen has access to the best possible quality health care and education, that's probably going to be uh, more important with every passing year in terms of determining whether or not your country is going to be able to uh, compete. Well, so equality of opportunity. Uh, now, everyone in this room is involved in uh, some form of disability rights, disabil the disability movement uh, writ large. Uh, what the summit has focused on last year and this year is a, a kind of a more narrow aspect of it, and that is employment. I mentioned jobs, careers, and self-employment. Um, and so, uh, as as we are trying to focus on that, how does our goal, which I've challenged people here, I heard Bill Kiernan talking about that with the group here earlier, uh, uh, doubling the rate of employment of people with disabilities globally by 10 years. So how does that, how does that fit in? How can we support the World Bank and how can you support this effort uh, looking at people with disabilities getting meaningful, not menial, but meaningful employment? I, I, well, I think it's a, it's a great goal. And, um, um, the, you, you know, one of the things that will kick in um, uh, starting next year uh, is a new environmental and social framework. And, and so 20 years ago, um, uh, with under the leadership of, uh, of uh, Leader Pelosi, but also I know that Senator Harkin, you were involved in this. And we had we we had we adopted, and it, and at the bank at that time they felt that it was forced uh, on us, but it, it's turned out to be the state of the art in terms of how we go forward. Uh, uh, the environmental and social framework that says that our projects has, have to be done in the context of certain uh, uh, moral principles, but also that we would continue to follow up. And uh, in, in, the, in the set of um, environmental social frameworks that we had up until now, it did not mention um, anti-discrimination um, and it did not mention people with disabilities, but the new framework does. Good. And so it, what, it, what, it, what it says is that every infrastructure project, um, every education health project uh, should consider uh, in, uh, in should, should, should work to ensure that people with disabilities have access. Right? So we're already doing it, not enough, it's, it's not enough yet, it's not a part of every single thing that we do, but now that it's part of our environmental and social framework, we have to adjust as an organization to really think about disability yes. uh, uh, access you know, for example, universal design in um, in in the building of buildings, and and uh, and and uh, um, you know, access uh, uh, ensuring that when we build roads or transport systems, ICT, that uh, people with disabilities have access. 
I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, uh, Darren Walker, whom you know, was head of the Ford Foundation was earlier, and, and they have now, uh, 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 is involved, they are involving a disability uh, awareness and disability, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, integrated fully in everything they do, so that's what you're, instead of segmenting it out and saying right. we're going to do a little narrow disability thing, it's going to be in all the efforts. Right. That's, yeah. That is so important. And it's going to take it's going to take time to get there completely. So for right, you know, it, it took, oh my gosh, 10, 15, 20 years uh, overall to make sure that we were getting gender disaggregated data. Right. And so now the question is, how do we take the steps to get disability disaggregated data? It's 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 a goal. It's in the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. And so now we're going to have to probably go through a similar process to try to ensure uh, that we at least know which of our projects are um, uh, taking into account um, um, universal design, access for everyone. But, I, you know, I, I, what I hope to be able to do is our human capital project, what, what, it, what it's going to show uh, is that uh, indeed uh, effective investments in your people, making sure that everyone is well nourished, making sure that everyone has access to health care, making sure that everyone can use uh, their brains and their hearts and the, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the most productive way yeah. is going to be the key to economic growth. And, and we're going to go further than that. We're going to, um, uh, if we can show, and, I, and we already, the preliminary data is overwhelming, if we can show, in fact, that uh, investments in human beings are directly connected, the quality of your investments in human beings are directly connected to future economic growth, then the bond rating agencies will have to take it into consideration. And so if the bond rating agencies take it into consideration, what will happen is that uh, you could see a country uh, and, and their borrowing costs will actually go up. And so what, what we hope to see is that, that heads of state, heads of government, and ministers of finance, who are the most important decision makers, will all of a sudden say, oh my goodness, we now have to be much more focused on ensuring that pe people have access to health care, to education, and this is everybody in the society has to have access. So um, we're, we're trying to create a situation where it's no longer okay to say, well, we're going to build roads and uh, you know, provide productive capacity, you know, energy, the traditional sorts of things that, that, that uh, countries invest in. And then once we get rich, we'll invest in people. Uh, what we're hoping to, to be able to, to, uh, uh, to put in place is a system that says, you have to invest in your people first. And, and it has to be truly inclusive, including people with disabilities. And that's your path uh, to becoming a wealthy, prosperous nation. It is in fact the path that was followed by most of the East Asian countries. In fact, you know, every single one of them, including China. You know, China invested in, uh, in their people, uh, in, like Korea, like Japan, like Taiwan, like Hong Kong, like so many other uh, 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 regions, uh, places, and countries. Uh, they all invested in their people before the World Bank thought that they should. I mean, this is quite, World Bank was telling these countries, you gotta invest in hard infrastructure first, and then when you get rich, invest in your people. Well, the, the East Asian countries ignored that, and that's where they are. And so I think, I think you know, the, this is all very good news in terms of um, improving access for people with disabilities. Well, thank you, Dr. Kim. We had, uh, there were questions submitted from audiences, and we've got a couple here that we would like to proffer to you. One is from Mark Wafer, I see him sitting here, from, uh, from Megling Treadstone, that's a company in Canada. Can you please comment on the viability of microfinance for people with disabilities in undeveloped nations. Microfinance exists for many groups in undeveloped nations, but not for those with disabilities. Organizations such as Rotary International would like to change that. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, the, the, um, uh, the impact of microfinance has been, uh, has been you know, um, uh, well noted and, and, and um, uh, you know, it's had a large impact. But we're, we, we want to go a step further. Um, uh, one of the things we've learned is that um, microfinance uh, uh, is very good for people, uh, especially for women, in, in informal employment. 
but very, very few recipients of microfinance lending uh, go on to, uh, uh, to create companies, you know, formal, formal uh, that, that enter the formal labor market, that, that they're actually hiring a lot of people. It, it's usually they stay small and they stay informal with microenterprise lending. Yeah. So microenterprise lending is important to start, and I agree that we should focus on making sure there's access uh, for, for uh, people with disabilities. But what I'm seeing is um, uh, the use of financial technology to radically change the way people access finance. So for example, in China again, uh, the company Alibaba, um, they found that the usual way of determining whether someone should get a loan or not, which is, it's called KYC, the know your customer. You, and traditionally, you know, in a bank in Iowa, you, you, you met the person, you shook their hand, you, looked, you took a look at their, at their collateral and see if you think that they're sort of a responsible person. And what Alibaba found is that that kind of approach to knowing your customer is antiquated and not nearly as good as just looking at their online behavior. So with Alibaba, uh, no matter what um, your disability might or might not be, no matter what um, uh, you know, background you might have, no matter what access to uh, collateral you may have, if your behavior online has been responsible and you've paid things back and you've sent things and the things that you said you're gonna do, you've done, then you can get as much as $150,000 from Ant Financial, which is the Alibaba uh, uh, financing arm, and that money will, from the minute you push the button to apply for it, to when it's in your account, two seconds. Right? And, and it's, all based, the, the, it, it's all based on uh, your previous online behavior, oh. right? two seconds. And, so, and also, again, uh, whatever um, your background, uh, whatever your disability, if you're doing things that is of value to other people, uh, Alibaba will give you access uh, to global markets. So access to capital, access to global markets, even access to marketing, access to uh, accounting services, it's all online. So I, I think that there is the possibility of leapfrogging you know, many generations of lack of access, not, not only to microfinance, but to, to much larger pieces of finance and to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to markets. And, and um, that's what we hope. And, and our hope is that the new technology in uh, financial access can radically democratize access to capital and, uh, and make it available to, to many, many more people. So the idea of microfinance for, for people with disabilities I think is a great one and, and uh, uh, Rotary, I encourage them to move forward. But then I also encourage them to think you know, beyond that and say, okay, so now, now that we've done microenterprise lending, what if they want to turn it into a formal market? You know, we just started a women's entrepreneurship initiative um, uh, with the current administration that's, you know, it's going to be uh, between a billion and two billion. Mm. And, I, and I think, uh, I know that, and we're doing this with Ivanka Trump, who is, uh, has been a great champion of this. And um, uh, uh, we're still in the process of formulating it, but I, I think she would be very supportive of the idea of ensuring that people with disabilities have access as well. Okay, I have, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, this is from Catherine Guernsey. Uh, over the last decade, I think you've already answered this, but maybe you might want to expound on it, expound on it. We have seen an increasing focus on the inclusion of marginalized groups in economic development efforts. As countries work towards meeting their targets <coughs> under the Sustainable Development Goals, what message do you have for development specialists and practitioners on the need to keep social inclusion at the core of what they do. Like I said, I think you've yeah, already kind of answered it's, that. It's, you know, um, uh, the, I think the good news here is that uh, all of this work we're doing on human capital, it, it, what it really suggests is that if you exclude anyone who could potentially um, use their, their hearts and their minds uh, and, and, and contribute uh, to uh, the, um, uh, uh, the society and to economic growth, you're really selling yourself short. And so it, there's, um, uh, what we hope is to create overwhelming incentives for heads of state and ministers of finance to figure out a way of investing in every single one of their citizens, regardless of gender, regardless of you know, uh, race or ethnicity or religion, and certainly regardless of disabilities. This is, this is, I think, the message that will come out very powerfully from the human capital uh, ranking that we're gonna put out uh, in about a year. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when, when you meet with uh, your bank employees, your, the people that work around the globe, uh, and I know you travel a lot and you meet with them, um, uh, are, do you encourage them when, when they're coming up with policy recommendations that go up the ladder to you, to encourage them to reach out to disability organizations, uh, advocates uh, in those countries, in those regions, to get to ask them, what do you need? What, how can we intersect with you? What's, what, what could the World Bank do to help your economic livelihood? And so in certain places we've been pretty good at, we've been pretty good at that, yeah. and in other places less so, and in, and, and in some places, um, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we know that, uh, that we have to do a better job. Now, uh, you know, more generally, uh, we have been uh, working very hard to, uh, again, be inclusive of literally everyone. And so, just to give you an example, um, I was just dealing with an issue in a particular country. Um, 74 countries in the world have, uh, um, have made uh, uh, the being uh, a part of the LGBTI community actually illegal, right? And so uh, while on the one hand we can't be political, we're now dealing with that particular issue. Uh, I think that um, what happens with, uh, with uh, uh, the organizations with disabilities is, is for the most part um, the, 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 uh, the governments and uh, other institutions, uh, are, they're just forgotten. And so I think that the important thing for us, now that it's in the environment and social framework, right, yes. uh, in order to go through the process of saying we have done our work it, with, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the context of the new environment and social framework, uh, the World Bank employees can no longer ignore uh, people with disabilities. And, uh, it, you, you know, the, the, the other thing we're doing is doing much, much more outreach to civil society and working with civil society organizations. So my hope is that w while we've made some progress, we still have a long way to go. And, and my, my hope is that both this uh, focus on human capital and uh, the focus on, on uh, specifically on disabilities that's now in our environment and social framework, we'll, we will see a, a big movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, you know, my message is always about inclusion. And, sure. and you know, the, uh, uh, th this is hard because now we're in a time where um, there's a lot of heat around movements of exclusion. In, in, in lots of countries, including, including this country. Yeah. And so um, I think that you know, there, there's no such thing as sort of uh, um, uh, you know, a group that's just sort of uh, beyond. I mean, you, I hear, you hear this all the time. Well, okay, so we've, we, we're, we're gonna be open to this group and that group and another group, but surely you're not serious that we have to be open to that group as well. Right? And I, you know, our, our message is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a uncompromising in terms of inclusion, and so it 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 has to include uh, people with disabilities. And and again, I I know you know this. We haven't spoken of it, but uh, uh, I'm every every nation that you deal with uh, is a signatory to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with right. Disabilities. So now we have that as sort of a, a leverage, and I think that. Uh, uh, a number of disability organizations in a lot of those countries now know that and they're willing to step forward because of that uh, because of that now we have asked you for your support for this summit uh, you've been uh, most uh, most uh, helpful on this and helping to bring people here uh, your what the World Bank has done has helped us to bring a lot of we've had more young people here this year than ever before and a lot of them are, are youth with disabilities, uh, they don't have the wherewithal to come here, but through the World Bank, you've helped to bring them here for this summit, so we are very grateful to you for that. So you've been helpful to us. Let me ask, turn it around. All these people here, <laughs> all, a lot of different countries here, they're, they're smart, they're bright, uh, they're aggressive. How can we help the World Bank meet those goals? What can all these disability organizations, I'm telling you, they're good. I mean, they're, they have power, they have depth, they uh, have support mechanisms. So how can we help the World Bank meet its goals? 
Well, I, you know, I, um, uh, let me first say that uh, you all should know that you have a fantastic friend and, uh, and, and champion in, in Senator Harkin because he's been after me uh, <laughs> since, since I started this job and uh, has helped me really uh, to understand things like you know, universal design. If you, you, you know, one of the things I learned as a, as a university president is it's incredibly expensive to retrofit old yeah, buildings awful, yes. uh, to, to make them accessible. And we had to do it, and we, uh, but, but it just made so much more sense to start from the beginning. And um, uh, I, you know, since that time, we have done a lot more work in, in really encouraging people to look at universal access as you put buildings, roads, infrastructure yes, together. Yes, yes, so that this, yes, has been, this has been yes. great. So I, I think the thing you can do is to continue to, uh, uh, to nudge and, and uh, uh, remind us. You know, uh, I, um, I, tell, I tell a story, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but um, they say that, uh, that it's probably true of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Right? And um, I, I use this story in, in talking about the human capital report because the human capital work that we're doing is to try to create a situation where heads of state and ministers of finance um, cannot help but invest more in their people. And so uh, Roosevelt apparently met with labor leaders uh, when he first became president. And he said to them, um, uh, I like your ideas. You, you know, it's very important that you're, you're, uh, you continue uh, to say these things. Now go out there and make me do it. Right? Make me do what, what I need to do. In other words, create a, create a set of conditions where leaders can't help but make the right decision. Right. So that's what I would ask you. So create conditions that will make us at the World Bank uh, be much more aggressive about um, uh, 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 in, in our efforts to make sure that, uh, that uh, people with disabilities have access to finance, to, to buildings, to, to, yes. to um, um, uh, jobs, uh, and uh, make it uh, um, impossible for leaders in developing countries to ignore people with disabilities. I think that, that's what I would ask. Um, you know, uh, we the the fact that this is that this uh, meeting is focused on work is really important. And we're we every year we do something called the World Development Report. We take on some major topic, and that and the topic that's to come is on work, and and uh, it'll be published probably in another I I, I don't I mean, at, least, you know, at least a half a year, maybe more like a year. And uh, one of the things we found is that um, uh, that we can't think about work. Uh, just uh, um, instrumentally, that you know, people have to work to make a living, or people have to work to to grow the economy. But there's tremendous meaning in having a job. There's tremendous meaning in in finding um, a, a, a good job. And so um, we're now uh, talking much, much more about. Uh, about uh, if automation, if artificial intelligence, if robotics is going to eliminate a lot of the low-skilled jobs, well, what kind of jobs do we need to create so that everyone can have this um, uh, meaningful experience of, uh, of having uh, good work? Right. And I think a lot of it is going to be uh, in empathy work. So health workers, education workers, um, uh, child care, adult, you know, uh, elder care. Uh, we think that the, 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 the jobs that will grow tremendously are jobs like that. Yeah. And, and so um, uh, I think, I think the, uh, the, the, the lessons from our World Development Report will be that um, uh, the right to a job and, and the importance of a job for people's um, uh, uh, intellectual, emotional, uh, even spiritual well-being is far more important than we had thought. And so that's going to be the message coming out of the, the, uh, the work WDR and certainly um, uh, one that's applicable uh, to people with disabilities. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that report. I didn't know that. I, 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 I hope that, that, uh, that it will look at the uh, employment of people with disabilities and uh, what that looks like uh, globally. We, we, we already know that it's not very good. Uh, uh, totally, uh, but uh, perhaps therein might lie some data points for us as we try to move forward, as we say we're going to double the rate of employment, maybe we'll get some data points from this report sure. that you might come out with. It would be very helpful to us sure. uh, as we move ahead. Yeah. So. Well, Dr. Kim, uh, I can't thank you enough for your, for your tremendous leadership of the World Bank, for your willingness to help the summits and for what you just told us about the environment and social uh, aspect of the World Bank and now it's going to incorporate in its broad aspect 
uh, consideration of, uh, of, uh, of people with disabilities. Uh, and again, uh, the, I, the fact that the World Bank also is looking at when, when you are uh, doing things for uh, uh, reconstruction of, of, of storms and things like that, that if they're going to build something new, have it universally designed, sure. uh, uh, not, not doing it just like they did in before. And we know that universal design is not, that, is not any more expensive and everyone benefits from it. So for those three reasons, again, I just can't thank you enough for, for your leadership of the World Bank. And I think I can say on behalf of all of us here, disability advocates uh, globally, uh, we stand ready to help and assist and push and prod you to make you do it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Are you going to close up? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.